So how do we do this? Well, always, always, if you can, draw um, a diagram to what's happening. Um, I gotta do that. So first I have ice, which is 800 grams. And again, one thing I want to emphasize is that you all know pretty much that water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius and ice will melt at zero degrees Celsius. That's what we call phase change, right? But ice can be colder than zero degrees Celsius, okay? That's something that you should be aware of because, I mean, if you have ice colder than zero degrees Celsius, you have to think about the, temp, uh, the amount of heat you need to heat it up to zero degrees Celsius before it can melt. But in this case, already at zero degrees Celsius, so we don't have to worry about, you know, the heat capacity of the ice itself. So when you melt the ice, the ice will start to melt. Oh, sorry, when you mix the ice with water, the ice will start to melt right away, right? So if things go smoothly, you're gonna have zero degrees Celsius of ice going to zero degrees Celsius of water. And of course, you're gonna have no loss in the mass, right? So that's gonna be what happened to the ice. Um, and then this water can potentially get warmer to the final temperature, which we don't know. That's what we are trying to calculate. Okay, and that's still 800 grams like this. This is for ice. Now we have water. The water part is easy because um, we just get like, you know, decrease in the temperature. So starting at 40 degrees Celsius, then it will just go to the final temperature like this. Water. Right, so this is what we think it gonna happen. Well, in um, you know the most general case, you probably need to think also: is there a possibility for some of this water will be frozen due to um, ice? If you have like a lot of ice, right, you can think about um, something like that. But um, in this case, we can assume that this is what's happening, and then solve for the temperature and see if it makes sense or not. Okay, but um, when you think about it, then this is probably um, correct. But we need to go one step at a time to check um, <coughs> what's gonna what's gonna happen. Okay, now um, the first step I gotta calculate is this step. Okay, so that's gonna be when ice melt and how much heat do you need? Well, this is when phase transition happen. So you need to calculate Q equal to ML. And M is 0.8 kilograms, right? 800 grams. And the L is the latent heat of fusion, right? Fusion works for both melting and freezing, right? It's the same number. But for um, melting, that's the heat that you need to put in. So it's 335 times 10 to the 3 because it's kilojoules, right, juice, and kilogram gonna cancel out. So this is what you get. And then when you calculate this, then you get about 2.68 times 10 to the 5 juice. Okay, so this is what happening. This is when all the ice melt. Okay, so let's assume that um, this is the heat that you receive from water going to um, lower temperature, right? So you have to check um, whether the heat that you have inside water is enough to, to do something like this, right? So let's calculate first what happened when, let's say, the water here goes to zero degrees Celsius, how much heat would you need to extract, right? And then you're gonna see whether that's enough to do this or not, right? So check 
Okay, check. Let's say Tf is equal to zero. How much T do you need? So this is when you use Q equal to mc delta T. So we have m, which is 0.4, right, 0.4 kilogram, which is 400 grams. And then C, which is the heat, uh, specific heat for water. So that's going to be 4,200. And that's going to be times um, delta T, which is the change in the temperature, right? So we assume that it's zero. So it's going to be zero degrees Celsius minus 40 degrees Celsius. And then you're going to see that it's a minus sign. And it's a minus sign because it's getting colder, so you need to take away heat from water. So let's calculate this and then see what's the number here. So you see that actually you're going to get minus 6.72 times 10 to the 4 joules. OK. Um, this is what we have. So what happened here? So think about this. In order for all the ice to melt, you need this much energy, this much heat. But even if all water that you have for 40 degrees Celsius get cooled down to zero degrees Celsius, right? That's the lowest you can go. You cannot go any further, right? The amount of heat that you're going to extract from water is going to be only 6 times 10 to the 4, which is about only a quarter of what you need, right? So you don't have enough to melt all the ice. So this problem is actually just checking this simple fact that do you have enough to melt all the ice? Do you have enough energy in water to melt all the ice? And the, yeah. Uh, delta is always final temperature minus the initial temperature. Yes. Okay. So that's why you get the minus sign. Um, I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can flip it around. But that's going to be very risky. So delta of anything is always final value minus the initial value. So the initial value is 40, and final is 0 degrees Celsius here. So we get minus sign here. And remember the point here? The point here is this. We need to, well, the ice is going to melt, right? And then the question is like, where does the energy come from to melt the ice? The energy has to come from the amount of energy stored in water at 40 degrees Celsius. Okay. So when the ice melts, this has to lose energy to melt the ice. So what we are checking here is that even if we lose all the energy from water, meaning that water is going to go to 0 degrees Celsius, and then what happens after that is going to freeze, right? So that's another story. But let's say you have all the energy in water going to 0 degrees Celsius. How much energy available to you? That's this much. This is not enough to melt the ice. So that means at the end of the process, when you mix these two together, you're going to have partially ice and partially water in your mixture. Okay, this is the main point here. So if that's the case, then you can just say the final temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Because if ice and water coexist, the only temperature that can happen, well, in the ideal case, is going to be zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so I'm going to write here is that since um, not all ice will melt, then the final mixture will contain both ice and water. So the final temperature is automatically zero degrees Celsius. 
Okay. So actually, we don't need to calculate this step because I mean, all the ice is not yet melted, and we 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 don't need to calculate how much hotter it is, right? This is a case where we have too much ice. If you think about this. Okay. Any question for this one? So it's not really a trick question. It's kind of like you know the 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 question that is designed for you to check um, about this you know heat required to to melt ice. All right. Okay. So without any other discussion, then let's go to the next one. This one is a little bit easier, but it's mixed with um, you know the concept of power. So I will give you only like maybe one or two minutes because it's a little bit simpler than the one before. All right, um, like I said, this one is a, a little bit simpler because it's just uh, you know pretty straightforward calculation of you know the required energy to heat up and to boil water. So again, just draw the picture here. So we have water at 50 degrees Celsius. So when you heat this up, first thing gonna happen is it's gonna go to 100 degrees Celsius. And then it's going to turn to vapor, which is also at 100 degrees Celsius. This is what we want, right? And all the time it's going to be 500 grams, right? So the first step is Q equal to MC delta T. And then the second step is going to be Q equal to ML, right? So nothing too crazy here. So M is 0.5 kilograms. C is the heat, uh, specific heat for water. We need to uh, either remember or go back and take a look at the number. And again, the midterm will be open book, right? So you can just look at the number in your lecture note or anywhere you want. So 14, uh, 4200 for the heat, uh, specific heat, and then times the change in the temperature. So that's going to be 100 minus 50. Right, because 100 is the final temperature and 50 is the initial temperature. So you calculate this and you get 1.05 times 10 to the 5 joules. That's how much energy you need to heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius. But now from water to vapor is a phase change, so you need a different formula here, which in a sense quite simpler because there's no change in the temperature. So it's 0.5 is the mass times the latent heat of vaporization, which is given here, times 2.26 times 10 to the 6 joules, right, because kilogram cancel out. So that's going to be 1.13 times 10 to the 6 Right, so total energy that you need is this 
plus this. So that's going to be about 1.235 or 2.4, I think, times 10 to the 6 joules. Right? So add it together because that's the total energy we need. It's this number. But we are not done, right? Because we are asked how long does it take to completely boil water. So how long does it take to be able to supply this much energy? Using 1500 watt heater, right? So power is energy per unit time, right? So the time it takes is just energy divided by power and the unit is going to be in seconds. So the energy we need is 1.24 times 10 to the 6. Okay. Um, the power is 1500. So divide by this, you get 827 seconds. Okay, in seconds. So in terms of minutes, that's about 14 minutes. So that's how long it takes to um, boil away all water. It's not an unreasonable number, I think, but you will see in real life that um, from water at 50 degrees Celsius to boiling water, it actually doesn't take that long, right? The long, the long process is to completely boil them because the um, latent heat is a lot larger. Okay, so, well, this one is hopefully all of you should find it pretty okay, right? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Any question for this one? All right, if there's no question, then let's go to the next one. This is about heat conduction, so it's quite a long problem. This one used to be a midterm problem, not last year. Well, kind of last year. Last year is something similar to this, but also a year before. Um, so it might be good if you can do this problem. Okay, so I'll give you maybe two or three minutes to think about this. Okay, so let's talk about this one. 
this is also what we discussed the very first week of this course, so quite some time ago. Um, the main concept that you need to understand is this. So if you have to, you know, region with different temperature, right? Heat gonna flow from hot to cold. And you remember the reason why, right? Because that's what the second law of thermodynamics tells you. So heat gonna flow from Tw to Tc, right? The warm to cold temperature. In the first arrangement, there are two paths that heat gonna flow. So you're gonna have heat flow through K1, we call it Q1. And then on top of that, you're gonna have heat flow to K2, which we call Q2. So for the first arrangement, the total heat flow is Q1 plus Q2, right? Because how much Q1 is flowing is doesn't matter what's happening here, right? So it's kind of independent. So if you have kind of two paths for heat to flow, they're gonna flow at the same time. So the combined heat flow is gonna be Q1 plus Q2. And I believe this is what we call QP, right, in the problem. Q1 plus Q2. Okay, so what is Q1 and what is Q2? We're gonna come back to that later. But now let's go to the next arrangement. For this one, K1 and K2, different material, are arranged in what we call a series um, connection, right? And since this is, I mean, think about this as like a traffic, right? If you have like two roads, different color might, might be in different, you know, like different kind of surface. Well, all the heat flowing through K1 will be what flowing to K2. And these two heat, it's gonna be the same, right? Because um, otherwise you're gonna have some, some kind of like, like concentration of heat somewhere along this. If you have heat flowing in, not equal to flowing out. So that's something that we, not, we, we, we assume that it's not gonna happen, okay? So the heat flow through K1 is gonna be the same through K2, right? So that means the total Q is just Q in this case, right? So if I call it Q1 prime and Q2 prime, just to be absolutely um, clear, then total in this case is QS gonna be equal to Q1 prime, which is equal to Q2 prime. Now, you're gonna come back to this a little bit later after the midterm. P here stands for parallel because they are in parallel. S here stands for series because they're connecting back to back like this. And you're gonna see the same thing con with connecting resistors after the midterm. Okay, and then the other thing we need to remember is that K2 is four times of K1. Now, let's calculate the total Q, right? So we assume also it's probably not given somewhere that each rod has the, um, you know, the cross-sectional area of A. Well, they are all identical. They're gonna cancel out anyway in the end. So that's fine. And the total length well, not the total length, the length of each rod is L, which is not given, and in the end, they're gonna cancel out also, right? So we kind of, you know, come up with these variables just to make um, calculation a little bit easier. So for the first arrangement, um, what is Q1? Q1 is heat flow, right? So if you remember um, heat flow, um, well, we can also say heat flow per unit time because if you remember the formula P, which is Q over T, that's gonna be proportional to K, the con con uh, thermal conductivity, times A divided by L times delta T, right? A is the cross-section area, L is the length of your conductor, and delta T is the temperature difference. 
all right? So this is um, power, which is heat flow per unit time, right? So if we talk about you know, the same time, then P is just proportional to Q. Right? So we can even write Q equal to Ka delta T times time. And again, most of these things will get canceled out in the end. Right? So this is the formula that we're going to use. So just do it like this. Okay, I'm going to draw a box here because not to interfere with my calculation for the first picture. All right, so Q1 is K1 A delta L times delta T, and that's going to be TW minus TC times time. Q2 is exactly the same, except different material give you different K. So it's K2 A over L TC minus TW minus TC times T like this. Right. And K2 is 4 times K1. So I can just substitute that already. So it's 4K1 divided by L A TW minus TC times T. So QP is Q1 plus Q2. Right. So you see that all the factors are the same. Right. So it's actually just 4 plus 1 here. So that's going to be 5Q1 over L a T W minus T C times T. That's the answer for A, right? Now for B it's a little bit more complicated because we know that um, the heat flow to K1 and K2 they are the same. But the heat flow to K1 is the difference between this temperature T W and this point which we don't know. And the heat flow through K2 is the temperature difference between this point, which we don't know, and Tc. So our first task is to actually find out first what is the temperature at this junction here. So I will call this T prime. Okay, so that's the first thing. And I'm running out of space, so I'm going to draw it like this. Okay, so we have TW and then K1, K2, and then TC here. And again, our first task is to find what is the temperature at the halfway between the two rods. So let's calculate heat flow through K1, which is Q1 prime. So Q1 prime is K1 times A over L times delta T, the temperature difference. In this case, it's TW minus T prime, and then times time. Right. It's the same formula, except in this case, we don't know what is T prime. So we just put it as like the unknown variable, which we're going to solve later. What about Q2? Well, Q2 is the same kind of Q2 prime. Q2 prime is the same kind of formula, which is K2 A delta L. But in this case, what's the temperature difference? Well, T prime here is going to be hotter than Tc, right? So it's going to be T prime minus Tc, okay? Don't swap the order here. It's very important, okay? So it's always hot minus cold, hot minus cold. So T prime is hotter than Tc. Right, so you cannot write Tc minus T prime. That doesn't make sense. And remember that K2, how much is K2? K2 is 4 times K1, so we can also substitute that in here. Times time. So how do we solve for T prime? T prime is actually can be solved by Again, using the fact that Q1 prime and Q2 prime are the same. Because heat flow through the first rod, 
how much heat flow to the first rod must be flowing through the second second rod. Okay, so Q one prime must be equal to Q two prime. So we need to equate this one and that one. So what do we have here? We have K one A over L T W minus T prime times T equal to this term here, which is four K one A over L T one T prime minus T C times time. And then you see that a lot of them cancel out and you are left with T W minus T prime equal to four T prime minus T C sorry minus four T C. So T W plus four T C divided by five that's gonna be T prime. Okay, solving this equation here you get this value for T prime which is the temperature at the junction between the two rods. So we have finished the hard hard part because like in the end what do we want? We we want exactly how much is Q1 prime, right? So we can either use Q1 prime or Q2 prime to calculate Q. That's gonna be the same, right? And then you just substitute T prime in this equation. So we're gonna use T, uh, Q1 prime. And then it's gonna substitute T prime into this equation, right? So we go a little bit fast here. So it's gonna be Tw minus T prime. So it's gonna be minus Tw over five and minus four Tc over five, right? No, this is just arithmetic. And then tidying things up a little bit, you're gonna have for fifth TW minus TC times T. And what is Q1 prime again? Q1 prime is equal to Q2 prime, and that's what we want for QS. So this is QS. So in the end, what's the answer of QP over QS? Well, QP is this. So I actually can write it in this page. And QS from the next page, right? From the next page we have here is K1A over L, 4 over 5, 4 fifth, times TW minus TC times T. Okay, so what we want is QP over QS. So this thing divided by this thing, and you can see that everything cancel out except for the number in front, right? So the answer is gonna be 25 divided by four. So this is the answer for this question. Okay, so it's a little bit long, but um, in terms of Calculating the hard one, I think, is the the one which has series connection, but um, it's gonna be um, you know something that we did here, which is not too bad, I think. All right, any question here? All right, no question. Then let's go to the next one. Okay, this is about thermal expansion, which is probably the first topic that we talk about in this course. So I'll give you a few minutes, okay? One or two minutes, because again, this one is not too tricky. And then we're gonna talk about this.
Okay. Let's talk about this one. Um, you might be a little bit, you know, intimidated by the fact that I'm not asking directly about the increase in the length, but the increase in the area. But if you think about what is an area, an area is just the product of the length and width of something. So if I have the initial area to be like this, then after you heat up this sheet, this length gonna get longer, so it's become this. This length will also get longer, so it become this, right? And you can pretty much find a new area by looking at the new length on each side like this. So this is the new area increase for this sheet. So your task is to find out what is the new length and then multiply those two together then you get the new area. Okay, so that's how we're gonna do it. So let's do that. So the first thing we're gonna do is I gonna call, well, I call this is the width and this is the length. Okay, so the new length, I will use L prime. The new length is gonna be, now this is important because some of you might get confused about the formula. The formula that we discussed in class is delta L equal to L zero alpha times delta T where alpha is the linear expansion coefficient which is given here for aluminum. This formula is delta L is the length increase. So if you want the length in the end, you have to add this length increase to the initial length, not just delta L alone, right? And if you do the calculation correctly, then you're gonna see that delta L is very small. So it doesn't make sense to say L prime is just L zero times alpha times delta T. This is wrong. It's wrong because we forgot to add the initial length to the change of the length. Okay, so actually I'll write it down here. So L prime is initial length plus the change in the length, which is delta L. So it's L zero plus L zero alpha delta T. So that's gonna be L zero one plus alpha delta T like this. So for L, initial length is two meters. So it's two meters, one times one plus 2.4 times 10 to the minus six. And then times delta T, the change in the temperature. The final temperature is 100. The initial temperature is 30. So the change of temperature, I can just write 70, right? I don't need to write it any more explicit than this. And then I calculate this, so I get 2.4 times 10 to the minus 6 times 70 plus 1 times 2 and it's going to be 2.000336 meters. If you forgot to add L0 in your length, the answer will be 0 0.000336, which is really, really small. We do the same thing for W. Delta W is W0, 1 plus alpha delta T, right? So W is just one meters. So it's actually just half of what we have for the length, right? So that's gonna be 1.000168 meter. Ah, sorry, you can see already that I messed up this formula. It should be W prime, like not delta W. Right. So W prime here. So the new area is, or I can call it A prime, is just L prime times W prime. So that's gonna be this times 
and that's going to be 2.000672 meters square. Okay, so that's going to be the answer here. All right. So not too bad, right? Again, the other thing to be careful is this formula gives you delta L, not L in the end. Okay, for L in the end, you need to also add L zero here. All right. So we're gonna do one more before we take a quick break. So let's do that. And remember, next topic we're gonna talk about, or we actually talk about in class, is um, thermal dynamics here. And this one, if you need, you can also look at the old note about for the formula. All right. But I'm gonna give you a few minutes to try to do this. So, sorry to interrupt. Um, the question here from uh, one of you is that can you multiply W and L first and then convert, convert alpha to gamma and then do it with the area expansion coefficient? Yes, you can do that. And um, you're going to see that the answer will be not exactly the same, but very close to each other but it's good enough. So the answer is yes, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the answer to the previous question, uh, sorry, since one of you asked, is 2.000672 meters square. All right. Okay, so let's go back here. All right, um, the only reason that, that you might not know how to do this is not because you don't know the material, it's just because it's so long away, so long ago that we talk about this one, okay? So um, 
you just need a quick review on the formula and then that will be fine right? and this one contained in your note but first you need to identify what kind of process we have here it's already given it's an isothermal okay so tell yourself what isothermal means it means the temperature is constant during the process so there's no change in the temperature no change in the temperature means what happened to the in this internal energy since delta u is proportional to delta t delta t is zero so delta u is zero in this case so there's no change in the um, internal energy of the gas so we answer a right away right so it's the change in the internal energy of the gas zero joules because there's no change in the temperature But it doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. You can see from the PV diagram that the gas expand, gas expand because the volume becomes larger. For isothermal process, the formula for W, which is essentially an area under the curve here, but because it's not a straight line, so um, you need to do integration and that's when you get the logarithm of the uh, volume. So the formula is N R T log of V2 divided by V1. V2, well, I call it V2, but it's just the final volume. V1 is the initial volume. So let's just write down what we have here. Um, num n is the number of moles, so that's 1.5, it's given here. R is the gas constant, it's about 8.31. Again, you don't need to remember because you're allowed to look up anything you want during this exam. And T is the temperature, 27 here. But remember to convert this to Kelvin. So you need to do 27 plus 273. So you're going to get 300 Kelvin here. Okay, this is probably one of the thing that some of you can miss. And then log of the ratio between the um, final volume and the initial volume. So it's going to be 0 0.02, just reading from the graph here, divided by 0 0.01. In this, in this particular case, yes. It's because if you look at the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is Q minus W. So since we say from the beginning that for isothermal process, delta U is zero, then Q is just equal to W in this case. Of course, if you have different process, not isothermal, then Q and W are not necessary, they're going to be the same. Okay? Uh, this is isothermal, it's said here. Okay? So that's why I highlighted with green one, that is isothermal. Isothermal means temperature is constant, right? Remember the four processes that we talk about, isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, adiabatic. All of them gonna be different shape of the curve in the PV diagram, okay? So for this one, it's isothermal, so it's not adiabatic. Is that, is that all right? Okay, so now we can continue. Um, so we're going to have 1.5 times 8.31 times 300 times log of just 2, right? Because 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.01 is just 2. So calculating everything. You get about 2,600 juice. So this is the work done. 
okay? And it's actually asked a little bit more than that. This is by the gas or on the gas. Well, it's just asking about the sign of work, which is positive. Positive means it expands. Expand means the work is done by the gas, okay? Not on the gas, because on the gas means you compress the gas, which is not what we have here. And then for the last one, well, you just asked a few moments ago, calculate the heat absorbed or released by the gas during the expansion. Well, Q is just equal to W. Okay, Q is just equal to W. So Q is just W equal to 2600 joules. Positive Q means the gas receives heat, so heat flow into the gas. So it's the heat absorbed by the gas. Right? So this is absorbed, and this is the work done by the gas. Okay? All right, let's take a quick break and then we come back and continue with uh, different questions. So I'm not, I'm gonna set the timer, but I'm not gonna show it to you in case some of you might want to look at this. Okay, so I'll be back in, in 10 minutes.
Okay, so it's about time. Uh, before I continue, is there any question regarding any problems that we have talked about? Not really? Okay. Um, well, after thermodynamics, we talk about wave. And one of the things that you need to know is how to interpret the wave function. For example, in this one, you're given a uh, wave function, which, I mean, it can describe any wave, sound wave or wave in a string. It's given by this, okay? And you're asked to find the wavelength, the frequency of the wave, the wave speed, and the direction of propagation. So I'll give you one minute to think about this. Okay. All right, the other thing that you need to remember is how the standard way of writing uh, the wave function is, right? So remember in class, we have the wave given by y equal to the so y of x and t, right? So x and t are the two free variables at its position on the medium and t is time so what am I writing here so it's y of x and t equal to a sine kx plus or minus omega t right so plus or minus tells you the direction of the wave propagation if it's a minus sign, then it's going to go to the positive x direction. So usually we do that in a horizontal um, way. But in this case, plus, right? So plus here means it's traveling. So going with going to negative x direction. So normally that's going to be going to the left. But again, that's up to you how you define the direction of your um, free variable x, okay? So it's going to be the negative direction. So that's the first thing we answer here. Okay, so now the other thing you can answer, but it's not asked, is the amplitude, which is given by this, because that's the number multiplying in front of the sine function. So it's going to be something like that. So we can add here that the amplitude, amplitude is 0 0.03 meters. So now you just need to compare k and the thing in front, omega and the thing in front. So the wavelength is k k is 2 pi over the wavelength and this is equal to pi over 8 so we can see that this means lambda the wavelength is simply 16 meters so that's the wavelength okay so it's just a direct you know comparison between the number multiplying in front of x now for omega, omega is 
2 pi f 2 pi the frequency equal to 8 pi which is this number here so frequency is 4 and the unit is hertz so the frequency is 4 hertz now we know lambda you know also the frequency the wave speed is v equal to f times lambda so just multiply the two together and the answer is 64 meter per second okay so all of this information these pieces of pieces of information is contained is just a single line of this function here right so this is a very compact way of saying all of this right. the amplitude is this the wavelength is this the frequency is this and the wave speed is this and also the direction of propagation okay so make sure you understand every single item on this list all right let's go to next one which is about standing wave this will be quite familiar to you because we asked the same question on the um, on in the lecture I think but maybe with different length so we have a pipe which is 50 centimeters long and both are both and are open calculate the lowest three frequency for standing wave and then you close one end and then you answer the question again okay the sound speed or the speed of sound is 330 meter per second okay so a few minutes should be um, enough to to do this Okay, so let's talk about this. So let's first think about the case where both ends are open. Right, so the situation we have is this kind of pipe. And um, if you are not quite familiar with the sound pipe or you know like the standing wave in the pipe, you can think of like the standing wave in string, which is probably a lot easier to visualize. So we're gonna do that here. So it's gonna look like this. And the ends are fixed, which is equivalent to both ends open. All right, so we talk about the reason behind this in the lecture. So go back and take a look. So the first lowest frequency is when the wavelength or the standing wave looks like this. And again, the key point that you need to remember is that one loop of standing wave that's equal to lambda over two. So that means lambda over two equal to L, which is the length of the whole pipe or the whole string. So lambda is just two times L, and L is 50 centimeters, so it's just one meter here. So that means the frequency is simply equal to uh, v over lambda 
So it's going to be 330 meter per second divided by lambda 1 meter. And the answer is going to be 330 hertz. So that's what we call the fundamental frequency. Again, sometimes we call this F0. Some books call it F1. They mean the same thing. Right. So it's the fundamental frequency or the first harmonics, which is the lowest frequency you can have for the standing wave in this kind of problem. Now, there are two ways of calculating the next one. You can draw the wave to be something like this, and then calculate using the same way, which is 2 times lambda over 2 equal to L, and then you can get lambda, then you can get the frequency because the velocity of um, sound wave stay the same. But if you remember that in this case, the harmonics of the, the second harmonics is the one that you need to write down. So you don't really need to rethink about this because you can just say, okay, the next one is F2 equal to 2 times F1 or 2 times F0. So that's going to be 660 hertz. And the next lowest beef uh, going to be the third harmonics, which is 3 times F1. That's going to be uh, 990 hertz. Like this. So that's the answer for the first part of the question. So 330, 660, and 990. Um, for the next question, um, one of the end is closed. So equivalent to the string, one of the end is open. So it's only half of the loop for the string, for the standing wave to open, uh, to, to happen. So this is half the loop. And one loop is lambda over 2. So half the loop is lambda over 4. So lambda over 4 equal to L. So lambda is 2 meters in this case. So the frequency is velocity divided by the lambda, which is the wavelength, like this. So that's going to be 165 hertz. So you can see that, again, by changing the what we call boundary condition, the frequency changes. So this is what we're going to call F0 or F1. The fundamental frequency is different now. And then for the next one, you can think about like it's one and a half loop. So in this case, you have lambda over two and then lambda over four. All together is equal to L, right? All of you remember that in this case, you skip the even harmonics. So the next harmonic is the third harmonic. So it's going to be F3 equal to three times F1. So it's okay to also say this if you remember. So it's going to be 495 hertz. And the next one, again, we skip the even harmonics. F5 will be 5 times F1. So that's going to be 825 hertz. So this is the answer for the second part of the problem, which is the lowest three frequency of the standing wave that can happen when one end of the pipe is open. Okay, so we just, you know, think about the equivalent system, which is the vibrating string. All right. This is nothing new because in the lecture, we look at exactly the same sample question. So it's just whether you can remember that or not. All right, let's look at the next question. This is one of the question that we have for the last semester midterm. It's about the uh, indifference of light wave. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes. Um, so that's one question. What happens if we um, have 
all ends are closed. So both ends are closed, right? Um, quick answer is it's going to be the same in terms of the frequency as the both end open. Um, the reason is because, well, okay, let me go back. So if both ends are open, then for the string, it's going to be the case where both ends are moving freely. So it's going to be still one loop, but it's going to be the loop where it's kind of a little bit flip. So one loop is this. This is still one loop, except like one half is this way, the other one is that way instead. So that's the only difference. But in terms of the allowed harmonics, it's going to be exactly the same. Okay, so it's a little bit flipped in terms of which end is kind of like oscillating up and down. But in terms of the harmonic structure, which frequency are allowed, it's going to be the same as both ends opened. Okay, so this is the answer. All right, let's go back to here. Uh, one of the question, what does D, you mean small d? Small d, what, that, what does it mean? It means it's the distance between these two holes, the slit distance. So S, uh, between S, uh, distance from S1 to S2. So when you do problems with, you know, interference of light, be very careful about the unit because some of the parameter will be extremely large, or well, not extremely large, but large, but some will be extremely small for sure. Like in this case, we have so many variables that tells you different length and distance, and one is, 0.1 millimeters, the slit distance. The length from the slit to the screen is two meters. The wave length is 600 meters. So it's like all over the place, right? So you just need to be sure that you, you know, you're aware of this, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, this question looks difficult. It's actually not difficult not that difficult. Um, 
because if you remember the formula for the position on the screen which is you know parameterized by this variable theta here depends on whether the path difference is you know construct uh, multiple of lambda or half multiple of lambda so we have this formula d sine equal to l lambda for constructive interference and half multiple of lambda for destructive interference so i going to write it a little bit nicer here so for a given that d is that l is that lambda is that calculate the angle where point p is the first minimum the center point o is always going to be the maximum that's when the path difference right between the two pole are zero is zero okay so the same same path so pd equal to zero and then when you go up a little bit you're going to go through the first minimum that's when the path difference is equal to half the lambda so first minimum means pd equal to just lambda over 2 if you talk about the second minimum then it's the second time you have const, uh, destructive interference so in that case pd will be 3 lambda over 2 okay that's the second minimum so the first is lambda over 2 so it's actually pretty straightforward because it's just d sine equal to lambda over 2 so sine of this angle is just lambda over 2d so we actually don't use the variable l at all so lambda is 600 nanometers times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 2 times d which is 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3 so sine of this angle is 600 10 to the minus 9 divided by 0 0.2 10 to the minus 3 and that's going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 3 so the angle is just arc sine of 3 times 10 to the minus 3 so in this case i don't really care which unit you use for the answer so if you do degrees it's going to be about 0 0.172 degrees or if you do radian, it's going to be roughly um, 0.3. Well, let me calculate that. It's going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 3 radian. Okay, either one is fine. As long as you write down what unit you are talking about. So that's the first question. The second one is, what is delta in terms of lambda if P is the second maximum brightness above point O? And then what is the distance Y? So delta here, that's exactly the path difference. So it's actually what it's asking is what is the path difference in terms of lambda when point P is the second maximum brightness. Again, at the center point O, path difference is zero. Delta is zero. That's what we call the zeroth order. And then above that, you're going to have the first maximum above zero. That's when path difference is lambda. And then you have the second maximum, which is what we are asking here. That's when the path difference is 
two lambdas. So that means delta is the path difference is just two lambda in this case. So it's more like a conceptual, you know, problem to us about path difference and all of that. What is the distance y? Well, to find a distance y, we probably need to use a different variation of this formula. So if you remember, d sine equal to n lambda, or you can rewrite this using small angle approximation. Sine is roughly speaking equal to tan, tangent. Tangent of the angle theta is y over l. So we say y over l here, equal to n lambda, which we have for two lambda for this particular point. So y is simply two lambda l divided by d. And it's two times 600 times 10 to the minus nine because it's nanometers times L, which is two meters, divided by D, which is 0.1 times 10 to the minus three. Okay, and then we have to calculate this. And the answer is 24 millimeters, or 0 0.024 meters. So about two centimeters, 2.5 centimeters. Okay, so that's the answer that we have here. All right, so you can see it's, it's more like a conceptual understanding of this whole thing. In terms of calculation, it's pretty straightforward. All right, any question for this one? All right, if not, then let's go to the next one, which is about geometrical optics. So it's pretty short one, so I'll give you a few minutes to do this. So determine the magnification of this situation, which is a converging lens, which is placed 15 centimeters away from the object. What's the magnification?
Okay, let's take a look at this. So we're not going to do the ray diagram because I think all of you know how to do that. So we can just use the formula right away, the lens and mirror equation, 1 over f equal to 1 over s0 plus 1 over si. And even if you don't do the ray diagram, it's probably good to just draw anyway the location of these things just to remind yourself what's happening. So the focal point is here. The image is somewhere here. Uh, not the image, the, the object. So like this. And the focal length is 20. The object is 15. And then we need to solve for the image distance. So you just need to solve this equation and then what you're going to get is si equal to 60 and not just 60 you have to have the minus sign here so the minus sign again what does it mean it means that the image is virtual It means that the image is the same side as the object. So that means the image is somewhere here. And that's why it can be used as a magnifier because if you look, well, this is your eyes, eyelash. If you look at this thing, it's going to look larger than the actual object. Right. So the magnification, again, is just the size of the image divided by the size of the object. And it's actually related to the ratio between the image distance and the object distance. So it's absolute sine of SI divided by SO. So it's just minus 60 divided by 15. So it's 4. So the answer is 4. That's the magnification of this um, configuration. If you change the location of the lens, that, that magnification will be different. Okay. So that's probably another thing that you should be aware of. Is the magnification um, depends on the location of the lens. Okay. It's not just a fixed number given the lens, which some of you might have known from, you know, like playing with, SLR camera or something like that, but there's some subtlety in that. But in, in this case, you can see that um, if you shift the lens position, then the magnification will also change. Okay, so we have time for probably one more question. And this is the one. So I'll let you do maybe like three or four minutes. And then we will talk about this.
Okay, we should have enough time to finish. So this is again an interference of wave. So the concept of path difference equal to n lambda, path difference equal to half multiple of lambda. That's the only thing that you need to really need to um, to understand. So we have two speaker um, facing each other like this, and the reason why the frequency is given and the speed of sound is given is for you to calculate the wavelength. So that's probably the first thing you need to do. So la uh, lambda is V over F. So that's going to be simply 0.5 meters. Okay. So V is 330, F is 660. So just 0.5 meters. So the two speakers are 10 meters apart from each other. So determine the location between the speakers where the interference is constructive. First, you need to just know that at least you can say right in the center here, the interference must be constructive, right? Because where you are here, whether it's constructive or destructive interference, it depends on the path difference between S1P and S2P. And right at the center, that's when S1P and S2P are the same, right? So the path difference is exactly zero. That's the condition for constructive interference. So this is where you have constructive interference. That's the easy point. Now, any other points, you're not going to have the same path difference anymore. And that can be a little bit tricky. Okay, so if you go a little bit to the right, the next point here, somewhere you're going to get another constructive interference. The question is where? So when you move to the right, let's say by some distance delta, the path S1P increased by delta, but the path S2P decreased by delta. So the path difference is actually two delta if you think about it. Right? If you move by delta, the path difference is actually twice of that. And this is one of the things that most people before you miss in the exam is that you move by delta and then you think the path difference is just delta. That's not the case because you need to um, count, kind of like count it twice. So move by delta gives you path difference of two delta. Again, convince yourself that this is the case. Okay, and path difference, the next point, this point at the center, that's when the path difference is zero. The next point where you have constructive interference is when the path difference is exactly lambda. So where is the next constructive point that's going to be delta equal to lambda over 2? So that's going to be 0.25 meters. So if you move from the center by 0 0.25, 0 0.25 meters in this way, you're going to get another constructive interference. And then you can calculate the next one, which is for 2 lambda, 3 lambda, 4 lambda. So you can see that every time you move to the right by 0.25, you're going to get another constructive interference. So between these speakers, there's going to be many, many points where you get constructive interference. And what we just show is that these points where we have constructive interference are 0.25 away from each other. Remember what is this called? This is called the antinode. This should ring some bell, right? This is actually just a standing wave. Okay, because remember what standing wave is? Standing wave is when the two wave which we have here, S1 and S2, travel counter-propagating each other, so one to the right, one to the left, and they interfere. 
okay? And this is exactly what we have here. So it's kind of like a different view um, to like the standing wave that we are used to. And we look at this in terms of the path difference. Okay? So um, that's pretty much all I want to say. Um, I haven't covered a few topics where we don't have time to do everything, but at least um, all of these are a, a fair game to appear on the midterm exam, okay? So again, the midterm is on Friday. If you are not sure about what time exactly, check the announcement in the Canva system again, okay? There's no change in that, all right? So please, 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 be careful, um, be sure that you know exactly what time that's, that's gonna happen, all right? And with that, I wish you all a very good luck and have, you know, like a good study in two days and I'll see you on Friday, okay? So please take care, get some sleep if you can and then Hopefully, you all gonna show up on Friday on time. All right. Okay, you can all go now. Take care, everyone. Um, we are still finalizing, but it's either gonna be about you know, ten or eleven something like that. It's not gonna be too different from that number. Um, so it's gonna be the, um, you probably need some extra space on your own to write it because um, I don't think I provide enough space to write everything. So you can write the solution in a separate piece of paper or PDF file and then just submit that solution, that's enough. Okay, any other question? Yes, exactly. So it's kind of like some, yeah, just like the homework, um, except it's time, it's very time sensitive. I wrote a very clear instruction about like what time you should submit it. Okay, so if you, I mean, the thing is that just if you have any trouble submitting in the Canva system, contact me right away or um, just email me your solution. That would be fine. Okay, but both um, Ajahn Vitun, which is the instructor for the other section, well, I'm not sure whether he's going to be around for the whole time, but I will be around during your exam time. So if you have any problem, any question regarding anything related to the midterm, then you can contact me right away.